Welcome back to the show. I'm Dan Shaheen. Today we're going to talk about back issues, but not just any back issue. It's probably my all-time favorite uh, Avengers issue, and it is for a lot of other people too. It's King Size Avengers Annual Number 10, uh, by, written by Chris Claremont, art by the great Michael Golden. Today on Comic Book News. <laughs> Hey, welcome back to the show. Today we're going to talk about ooh, one of my all-time favorites. I've been waiting to review this back issue for a really long time, but the more I started looking at it and looking into it and researching it, the more crazy stuff that I found that I had to research that I would be able to talk about it in an informed way for you, the discerning comic book news fan. So what we're seeing here is the original cover to King Size Avengers Annual Number 10. I want to make a quick side note. This cover is by Al Milgram. And uh, say what you want about Al Milgram, um, but this is not the greatest cover of I, I've ever seen. In fact, I'd go out on a limb and say that this is the ugliest cover to the most beautiful looking comic I've ever seen. So I, 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 maybe somebody out there in the comments can recommend another book with an uglier cover that's so great on the inside, but I don't know it. What's really interesting about this book is it sprang as a direct response from a super controversial issue of the Avengers, Avengers number 200. We're going to talk about that a little bit, bit today. That issue was, plot, get this, plotted by Jim Shooter, George Perez, Bob Layton, and David Michelini. With, but David Michelini credited as the writer. And it's got some real creepy stuff that we will talk about. Um, but first, let's talk about covers a little bit more. So today we're going to look at tr the True Believers edition of this King Size Avengers 10. Now, to find an issue of this in even decent condition these days is costing quite a bit of money uh, because of the first appearance of Rogue. Um, so, I recommend seeking out one of these. There's plenty of these out there. These cost a dollar. These were a promotional reprint done uh, for the Captain Marvel movie because Captain Marvel is so heavily featured in this comic. Um, and it's great. A, a better deal for a buck uh, is not to be had. The only better deal was buying the original for 75 cents. I've also got a look here at something Michael Golden did in recent years where he imagined what, if he had got to do the cover, what it might have looked like. And man, let me tell you, this is a great cover. And not exaggeration once we get into the contents uh, of this book because, man, Rogue really makes a slamming debut. So, uh, you know, but uh, why are we talking about it? We can go straight to the movie. Hey, Million Dollar Comics Cam. That's right. We've got King Size Avengers Annual Number 10. And as a bonus, I brought in Avengers Number 200. Just so we could take a look at what all uh, the hype is about. So let's talk about... Let's segue into issue 200 for just a moment. And we'll come back to King Size 10. So this is a great book. I mean, not a great book. This is an interesting book with great art um, by the great uh, George Perez and Dan Green. Uh, Co-plotted, like I said, by Jim Shooter, George Perez, Bob Layton, Dave McLeany. Now, what happened in this issue is this supposed to be like a, a joyous anniversary issue. Captain Marvel is going to be pregnant. She's going to have a baby. But due to editorial interference, they decided we can't say pregnant. We can't make her pregnant. So we're going to do something a lot weirder. Um, basically, the story opens up with her giving birth, and the Avengers are all gathered around like proud family parents and stuff. And but she is like really weirded out. She's in this sort of weird kind of trance state. And anyway, the baby's finally born, and she comes out of it, and she's like, "Man, Jan's like, I wanted to congratulate you, the Wasp. You know, uh, you're so lucky to lucky." Wasp, think about what you just said. I've been used. This isn't my baby. I don't know who the father is. So if you want to help me, please just leave me alone. Okay, she's creeped out by it, as you would be if you were suddenly pregnant for and for no reason. I'm not going to go over all the pages of this issue, but basically the baby, in true like sci-fi fashion, is growing up rapidly. So it's becoming a human or becoming growing up fast and can speak English. And it's quickly like asking for a laser torch and electronic components to build something. And Iron Man's like, eh, sure, why not? Let's give it to him. Let him tinker. What's the harm in that? 
okay anyway so he's growing up super smart he's building this thing meanwhile there's all this kind of time dilation activity things from the time stream dinosaurs and knights and world war one fighters are all like springing up all over the place obviously his presence in our timeline or in our dimension is doing something and why we were quick to learn oh quick segue comic books for sale nice prices in here um anyway we're quick to find out exactly uh who this dude is right his name is marcus he's the son of immortus okay and uh as we, he grows up through here, he's got an agenda. Avengers are fight are busy fighting all these basically uh, time dilation effects or whatever. Um, but then we get to learn the truth about our man Marcus and uh, and 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 his true origin, and it's creepy. So he himself is the child of Immortus, and Immortus plucked a human from the time stream who was gonna die. So her timeline was gonna end anyway. Brought him to his dimension. Uh, pulled the woman from the chill waters uh, and once back in limbo through a combination of gratitude and the subtle manipulations of my father's ingenious machines the woman fell in love with him okay creepy right there uh, they've got a spot in limbo since time doesn't exist in limbo he creates a pocket where time can exist and thus sun can be conceived and there is um, a subtly influenced machine influenced love happens um, and Marcus is born, right? And, 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 and lives in limbo, but like is bored and, and, and wants to get out. So he figures, look, my dad pulled this trick. So why don't I do the same thing? And I'm going to reach out and, uh, uh, pull you in here. And then through the electronic wonders at my command and with my inherited powers, I was able to implant my essence within you. Causing a condition that resembled pregnancy. Creepy. So she's not pregnant. She's pregnant, right? With, by this dude without her choice who's got these mind-controlling uh, machines from Immortus. And so finally she wakes up and she's like, she's like, oh, I don't know why, but I still feel drawn to you. I still want to be with you. I'm not sure why. It's really obvious that she is still under the manipulation somehow. She's under some kind of mental manipulation. But the Avengers are like, oh, sure, why not? And Thor just uses his hammer to, like, send him back to limbo. Um, and then, you know, I guess you're right. That's all we can do and believe in, and hope that Ms. Marvel live happily ever after. The end, right? Okay, not the end at all. <clears throat> Enter Chris Claremont who's decided to introduce a new character, Rogue. Uh, a, a new mutant who can, uh, spoiler alert, she can absorb the powers of other superhuman beings, okay? And man, what an issue. This has got guest stars. This has got first appearances. Uh, this has got amazing battles and terrific art and storytelling um, by Michael Gold and Chris Claremont. Now, I've talked about Chris Claremont a little bit. I'm not the hugest fan of his super verbose style. But what I was able to get out of this book is you could actually read this and you can skip almost all of the caption stuff and still understand the story. That's how good the storytelling is. So let's take a look and we are going to look at this. Um, so it starts off in San Francisco right away different than most Marvel comics. For me being a West Coast guy, I was pretty excited to see this. Again, this is the $1... Um, true believers version of this uh, it's not a facsimile edition and it doesn't have the original ads or the original cover right it's a little bit different um anyway this issue uh, features jessica drew spider-man and the first thing is someone jumping off the golden gate bridge and she rescues her who is this lady we don't know she plunges into the ocean and she's got to swim all the way in the bay by herself while carrying somebody but she's a superhero so she does it um she immediately shows up at the ocean beach uh police station i guess uh hospital which is probably not where you would go if you fell into the bay but all right san francisco geography um anyway she's there and, and they come to realize they know who this is this is carol danvers carol susan jane danvers right but she appears to have regressed to a completely blank mental state and is like an infant we don't know what happened to her and uh she definitely doesn't 
uh, uh, know what's going on, right? So uh, Jessica Drew is like, I know somebody who might be able to help, right? And, and contacts uh, the X-Men, Kitty Pride, and here we are in the X-Men in the Danger Room. We get some beautiful, this is one of my favorite panels of all time of the Danger Room. Michael Golden is just an artist's artist. I love him so much. Just this picture, the mechanical thing. Cyclops, who has to hold this thing absolutely still while Nightcrawler teleports. One thing that's interesting is like, in this era of Marvel Comics, there was an editorial mandate by Jim Shooter that you had to like explain everybody's powers kind of like every time. So like, there's all these caption boxes about, oh, without warning, Night Cy Nightcrawler disappears and it reappears with the smell of sulfur and a teleport. Like I said, you could kind of skim over that stuff now. In, in more of a modern style, we've eschewed uh, all this uh, expository dialogue and caption. I think the true answer is somewhere in the middle, right? You got to have some exposition to clue people into what's going on, but it doesn't. You don't have to hit them over the head with a hammer, issue after issue. Anyway, um, the X Men um, have been are now in contact, and they're gonna go find out what's going on. Um, Professor X travels there and uh, reads uh, Danvers' mind and sees one residual image. Rogue, this creepy lady. This is the first appearance of Rogue right here. It's a mental image. But man, the next appearance is right here as she is, we don't even get to see the fight. She just clobbered Captain America. She didn't take any powers yet because next she kisses him and takes his powers, which is a weird, creepy it type image to see. Um, but great wonderful she is just kicking ass and she throws captain america through the avengers window okay and just like throws him into the mansion like like he's nothing uh meanwhile uh stony Tar tony stark rather is chiming in and is ready to join him but up uh, is quickly finds out that who she thinks is uh uh the wasp is actually Mystique of the Brotherhood of Evil Mutants. And she's got a neural inhibitor thingamajiggy that freezes his armor. Okay. Next, back to the mansion. Look how fast this is going. This is a 39-page comic, I believe. And, man, there is so much action packed in here, page after page. Uh, Thor, returning to the Avengers Mansion, decides that, oh, there's somebody hurt. Captain America's hurt, so we need Don, Dr. Don Blake. Another thing that's disappeared from the comics. Bam, taken out by Rogue. Almost immediately, and as she's ready to go in for the kill here, here comes Spider-Woman, who because her co she's so fast and her costume it covers most of her body, I guess it's really difficult and she can't touch her. Um, and uh, and then, but in comes Thor, and she can touch Thor and steal his powers. And I thought this was weird. Thor is magical, but like I guess Rogue's powers are, are, are kind of odd in who they can and can't affect, right? Um, but anyway, she quickly, she gets the power of Thor. So now she's got the combined powers of, uh, spoiler alert, Captain Marvel, right? Who's powerhouse on her own. Then she took Captain America's powers and memories, by the way, um, but only temporarily. She's got Captain Marvel's permanently. She's got Cap's powers temporarily, and now Thor's powers temporarily. Going to be tough to stop her. She's able to KO the Vision with one punch. And what a punch. Because she knows that uh, she can't affect the vision because he's a synthoid. Uh, so she like pushes Thor in the way and brutally takes him out with a punch. But ooh, in comes Wonder Man, who's another one that she can't affect um, because of the nature of his powers. Wonder Man's always been weird that way. Like something about this ionic energy that powers him makes him like the purple man can't affect him and rogue can't affect him. There's just something unnatural about him. Anyway... She's still she still got Thor's strength and Captain Marvel's strength, so she's able to like make pretty short work of him. But gets away. It says like, look, there's three people that I couldn't affect. That's more than I expected. So I better get back to Mystique. Uh, so the Avengers huddle up and they kind of recap the Avenger, the creepy events of issue 200 with uh, Marcus and Captain Marvel that we just discussed. And they talk about man, look at him. I mean, as good as the George Perez artwork was. How great would it have been to have Michael Golden? Look at this. This is a beautiful Michael Golden panel. Anyway, um, the X-Men, or, or, or rather, uh, um, Beast is able to tell that it's temporary for Thor and Cap, uh, but we don't know how long exactly. Cut to uh, Riker's Island, a prison, and uh, an, an escape attempt. The Brotherhood of Evil Mutants are ready 
uh, since Destiny can see the future, she knows what's coming. They're ready. They just have to be ready. They're all prepared. And now they just use Iron Man's frozen armor like a missile to take out the pot, to take out the generator. Another great, beautiful mechanical shot. And all, and nobody else is prepared for it and able to take advantage of it before the backups kick in, except the Brotherhood of Evil Mutants because they're clued in from Destiny. And here comes the Blob, who really is the the Brotherhood in general are just shown to be like really powerhouse characters in this in this issue so blob uh avalanche pyro destiny right they get their costumes back and here we get to see this new brotherhood of evil mutants um and and what a group right uh and instantly the avengers come to attack and we get into a brouhaha of epic proportions at the prison between the brotherhood and uh and the Avengers, right? This is a crossover battle between two uh, super worlds like in the Marvel Universe that was so exciting to see. Well, you didn't see the Brotherhood fight anybody but the X-Men very often. But here we do, and we get to see Avalanche's killer powers, and we get to see Pyro making giant flame creatures. Uh, meanwhile, Mystique uses her powers, changes into Nick Fury, and takes off to go take care of what's going on after getting clued in by Destiny. The, the battle rages, man. This battle rages for pages. I, I don't want to go into it all. I don't want to give away every beat. But this is just such a well-paced and well-written battle scene. You can tell what's going on every step of the way. Destiny's using her powers. And her powers are, are depicted and talked about as like, she can't tell the absolute future. It's always really about probabilities. So sometimes she's off by a split second or not quite right. She It's not perfect, right? And that's where, the, where you're able to beat them. Anyway, you get to see so much great stuff uh, in this battle. Avalanche is a you know a true powerhouse. He's taken out whole buildings. Enter disguised Nick Fury, who uh, Iron Man, who 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 uh, Spider Woman is rescuing. She's like Nick Fury's at a security conference right now, so he can't be in two places at once. So obviously it's not him. It is Mystique, um, and and a, a battle between them. Uh, going down but finally rogue felt that punch so she could tell that thor's at least in captain america's powers um are starting to wear off right and that she doesn't have, have she still got captain marvel's abilities but that might not be enough to take on all the avengers anyway this is where we get crazy into crazy stuff with scarlet witch who's using her hex powers to just make things are popping off boilers are exploding and then she does something oh we get to see you know mystique somehow has access to the craziest highest tech weapons and technology stuff it's not really explained how but you can sort of infer if she can become nick fury she's got all these crazy things anyway uh now scarlet witch pours her power she blew up this boiler and pyro took control and turned it into a giant flame monster and this is where the first time i saw her powers which were also always talked about as being probability based like she made very unlikely things happen well, in this, frankly, having a fire monster turn into stone strikes me as a little bit beyond unlikely and into the realm of, like, impossibility and into the realm of, like, magical manipulation. So that's what I think is going on here, um, is that Claremont realizes there's more to Scarlet Witch than just probabilities. Anyway, man, the battle continues to rage. It's so well written and paced. And even with the Claremont dialogue, it reads quickly and well. The Blob is a serious threat, you know, punching Wonder Wonder Man and like sending them into the next county and and really being a pretty tough guy, tough to beat. And they're a, they're able to get him only by like teaming up and and causing like a giant mud pit to get him trapped in. And that's the end of the battle. And then back um to the Avengers Mansion where they're all uh or sorry, to the uh Xavier's Mansion where they're all hanging out poolside. Yeah, hanging out and uh and talking and they're talking it over and, and the Avengers are like, oh, good to see you, Carol. It's great. You know, uh, hey, what happened to Marcus? After you left with him, we didn't expect to see you two lovebirds again. I'm sure you didn't, Hawkeye. Marcus is dead. What? And she, she drops the, the plate of glasses and she's slapping Thor. And she's like, look, guys, I didn't love Marcus. I never loved Marcus. Don't any of you realize what happened months ago, what Marcus did to me? Guys, maybe our visit was a mistake, right? And she recaps, she's like, basically, dude, he manipulated me. He controlled my mind. 
And then as soon as we got to back to Limbo, he just basically super aged and turned into dust. And I was trapped there. I had to figure out my way out. And once I got out, I wanted nothing to do with, with you guys. You really screwed me. And uh, she's going to... She's going to leave and take off and be fine on her own now. But sort of this was like a resolution to a story that was very controversial, right? This Avengers 200 was extremely controversial. There have been a lot of articles written here on the rape of Captain Marvel, which is essentially what this was, right? And it talks about issue 200. This is a really good article. Um, and, and just talks about how weird it was and how Chris Claremont had to come in and kind of like, uh, save the character, right? In although Chris Claremont has taken a lot of heat himself for whatever uh, allegations of misogyny or something, but like he really didn't like what happened in that issue two hundred and wanted to undo it and, and say why it was wrong, and he did. This uh, is a fairly famous essay by Carol A. Strickland. He talked about this, and she brings up finally after relative weeks of such efforts, and admittedly with a subtle boost from Amoris's machine, she became mine, and just talks about how in general. You know, there's a lot of misogyny in superhero comics, which you can debate, but there's no debate that this is a creepy issue. And finally, Jim Shooter himself, I did not write Avengers 200. And he recalls it. He goes, look, I found my copy of Avengers 200. I read it, and I agree with the consensus. It's heinous, but I don't remember how it got that way. Uh, I am not. I am credited not only as editor-in-chief, but one of the co-plotters. However, I didn't see anything in the book that jogged my memory. No bits I remember suggesting. No corrections of the sort I might have made uh, to a plot passed before me. But I did see many things I would have changed if I'd seen the plot. For instance, leaving aside Ms. Marvel's mess for the nonce, Iron Man thinks it's okay for the weird, mysterious child to be given a laser torch and electronic equipment so he can build a machine. What? As the massive machine is being assembled, no one bothers to question what it is or does? What? Trouble ensues? No kidding? Really? Good grief? All right, Jim. Uh... If anybody knows the stories of Jim Shooter, he was he was uh, uh, notorious for being super heavy-handed uh, in his uh, editorial decisions, and so I don't believe for a second that he didn't have a lot to do with this, especially with the changes of a condition resembling pregnancy. Okay, uh, so this was a creepy issue, but man, what a fantastic comic! Uh, this is right. It's it's about as good as it gets, in my opinion, for a back issue. Uh, and and while it might be expensive to uh to find a you know a good copy of the first printing, luckily this dollar size version is available. I recommend you seek it out. Every time I see a copy or copies of this, I buy as many of them as I can for a dollar. I mean, the only thing better of value, like I said, was the original seventy-five cent price on this uh, incredible issue. So seek this one out. Read it. Find a couple copies. Give them to friends. Give them to people who maybe who like the X-Men. Oh, and one other thing. I always thought this is the perfect template for how to introduce the X-Men into the uh, Marvel Cinematic Universe, right? You bring in Rogue as a villain to begin with and take Captain Marvel's powers. And that would give us the super-powered Rogue from the comics that we have never seen in the movies, right? In the movies, Rogue was always, in my mind, the, uh, the the most different in the movies than she is from the comics because they didn't have the rights to Captain Marvel. Now all of that stuff is under one house. You can do Rogue right. You can do Brotherhood of the Evil Mutants right. You can give homage to one of the greatest back issues of all time, King Size Avengers Annual Number 10. Guys... Thank you uh, for watching. If you watch this, you're one of the hardcore. You're one of the true people who loves comics, right? I love it. I want to hear from you. I love your comments. We have one of the best comic sections I've ever seen uh, on a YouTube channel. I read every comment, and if there's any garbage, I strip it out. I haven't really seen any garbage in there yet. There's been a lot of really interesting points raised uh, by you people watching those videos, and I want to continue mixing it up with you. So thanks for watching. Uh, thanks for checking out this video. Thanks for liking, commenting, subscribing, and hit that bell for notifications. And we will see you next time. Thanks for watching.